G'day, fellas. Just before we get into the meme magic, I just wanted to let you know that we're going to be hosting a weekend barbecue this weekend and every weekend from now on. The games are going to be starting at 2 p.m. CST. They're going to be running until 10 p.m. CST. We're going to be playing ranked, unranked, free for all. We're going to be doing team games, casual games. We're pretty much just going to be doing absolutely everything. Uh, so if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, I encourage you to jump on the Discord. Feel free to drop in. You can drop out without any worries. Uh, if you want to stay all day for an epic gaming session, then, you know, fire up the grill, get those burgers flipping, and uh, we'll be opening up a couple of channels in the Discord so that you'll be able to find games uh, more easily. And I'm looking forward to getting to speak with a lot of you guys in the voice communications. So let's get into the meme magic. Today, I'm bringing you a game for the Dutch. We're playing on the map Saguenay, and we're up against a French player. So in the most recent patch, the Dutch have been amended so they lost their starting uh, wood crate and a starting food crate and they were given an extra coin crate this was a bug and it's now been fixed so we now start with 200 wood as the dutch and the reason why this is big is because it gives us an incentive to go trading post first we weren't able to go trading post first before because we only started with a hundred wood uh, and so now we can go trading post first and you might be wondering okay well why are you going to go trading post first You've got banks. Banks give you a shitload of XP. Well, you see, in this build, we're not planning on building banks at all. Banks are not part of our plan. What we're planning on doing is reaching the Fortress Age as quickly as possible, and then we're going to be shipping P-Tarts. We're going to be killing our enemy's town center before he can get up. Hopefully, we're going to be able to keep him down so that he's not able to age up at all, and that as a consequence, he simply leaves the game. Even though I've got 180 coin spare, I'm not training my 10th villager, and the reason why is because I want to ship three villagers. And if I train that 10th villager, it's going to population block me. So what I do is avoid sending it, or avoid uh, training it, and simply uh, send three villagers. So the idea is that we want to age up as quickly as possible. Now because it's Saguenay, we start off with some sheep in our immediate vicinity. So I'm consuming the sheep so that we're able to age up just that little bit faster. We're aiming for an age up time around 3 minutes 30 to 3 minutes 40. And then hopefully we'll be able to hit the fortress age before 6 minutes. Then, once the enemy is in transition to the fortress age most likely, we'll be killing their town center. The only exception for this really is for the Portuguese. Uh, when a Portuguese does a, a fast fortress, um, they've got two town centers, so you never know which one they're going to be going for. This isn't part of the build. I encourage you guys not to do this. Don't accidentally click on an outlaw rifleman when an enemy scout is nearby. This is a recipe for disaster. Uh, so I, I accidentally clicked on it when it was in range mode. I wasn't intending to. I, I wanted to get close to it, uh, but I end up losing quite a bit of health. And now you can see on the mini map that the French explorers come to say good day as well. Um, and, and he's just absolutely schooled me when it comes to that treasure. So instead of trying to contest him, I just hightail it out of there. So we're aging up with the governor. And the reason why we're using the governor is because the trading post, or rather the uh, outpost that we get from the governor, is going to provide us our forward shipment point. We're not going to place it at the front of the enemy base where they can see it. We want this to be a secret. We've gathered 310 coin. Once we age up, we're going to be making uh, two settlers. We've also been sure to gather 100 wood during transition. And this 100 wood is going to be used uh, to build our house. So now that we can we can build those settlers. So we've got the 100 coin that's saved up. 200 coin from the governor. And then we're going to ship 700 coin from the home city. So all we really need to do is just focus on food. So we've still got 12 settlers. Which is you know, quite a fair amount of settlers. That's not really uh, a small amount. Even though we've skipped so many villages, we've still got you know a, a reasonable amount. With the outpost wagon, we're doing our best to hide it. We want to make sure that our opponent can't see this outpost wagon. So I moved my envoy a little bit earlier into harass a villager that was out on the extremities of a hunt. I just started right-clicking on him, and he, he just moved in. And you can see the, the hunt dead on the ground right there. If that villager was still out there, he would have been scouting or he would have been able to see my outpost wagon. So that's a way that you can use the envoy to convince your opponent not to be somewhere. So with this outpost, all we're using it for is for a drop-off point. We're not at all seeking any form of tactical or strategical advantage from it. All we want is that forward 
drop off point. So I'm not, you know, moving it close to the water, I'm not moving it close to that hunt. So we've now got our third shipment. Our third shipment's come in really quickly. We wouldn't be able to do this if it weren't for the trading post. I did try a couple of different build orders for this strategy, but this one definitely seemed to be the best build order by far, just because it enabled you to maintain an early game economy while still being able to ship petards on time. So now that we're in queue, uh, we're on in the transition on the way to the Fortress Age, we're preparing for what happens in the Fortress Age. We've also spotted an enemy stable, so it's, keep in mind it's only at 535 and we're almost aged up here. So once we age up, what we want to be doing is building a house and we want to be uh, building a stable. Once we've got our stable up, we want to be making rooters out of it. We ship our six petards. We make sure that we've, we've trained a villager before we ship our six petards so that we don't population block ourselves. And because I know that the enemy stable is up, what I'm doing here is I'm sending my envoy to attack the explorer so that I can distract the cavalry. If I send the envoy to attack the explorer, I know that he's going to be sending his cavalry, and there they are, his cavalry right to that, ex uh, to that explorer to help him out. And so by doing that, it means that his cavalry is not in his base. And if his cavalry is in his base, then our petards are going to have a hard time. Because these are hussars. These aren't ulans. If these were ulans, we'd have no problem. Because as you all know, petards counter ulans. But petards do not counter hussars. Hussars, they are... Them. Hussars are not to be messed with. So at 646, we're hitting the enemy's base with our petard attack. We've got six petards, which is more than enough. So... With uh, the killing of the enemy town center, we're able to... With the killing of the enemy town center, we're able to gain enough experience for our next shipment, which is five Hussars. So the game plan with the five Hussars is that we're going to ship these Hussars into the enemy's town, and we're going to try our best to prevent them from building a, t a town center. Because our enemy most likely would have been aging up to the fortress age, and so all he's done, he's got a market, he, he would have just bought wood, and he would have just been, you know, tasking his uh, explorer as well as some villagers to build his town center as quickly as possible. And in the meantime, he, he would have been gathering. So what we want to do is we want to prevent him from getting that town center up at all costs. So we spot an enemy raid back in our base, we send our rooters, and here we spot the town center, we can see it's at 3300 health, so I send over a single hussar. Now I, I, that's quite a big mistake, ideally I should have sent my entire batch of hussars over there, uh, because what we want to do is we want to make sure this town center does not get up. So if we can kill that explorer, the faster we kill him, the less health this town center is going to have, and the less likely it's going to get up. But in the meantime, what we are doing is we're killing settlers. So, so far we've killed uh, about four or five Coury de Bois, or Coury de Bois, and we continue to take them down. But once that town center's up, that's it for us. We have to transition from this point. We were hoping for a cheesy win, and now we and now we don't have, and now we're actually going to have to play this game out. So that statement that I said at the start, that we're not going to be building banks, I have to rescind that. We're going to be shipping wood. We're now going to be building banks because we need to get in back into this game. We're down a thousand points. Our enemy is going to be able to push out because they've got the town center. They're going to be aging up most likely within the next 10 to 15 seconds. So what we're going to do is try and idle them as much as possible. We want them to not be producing units. We just want them to, to be sitting in their base, you know, gather wood, gather that coin. Just, we don't want units, we don't want you on any resources that are, are going to help you. So, we spot the enemy aging up at 9.15, so still quite a competitive time for him. Uh, and I know that the very first shipment he's going to be sending is most likely Dragoons. So, I know that I don't have long to keep applying pressure. I've, I've got at most another 20 seconds that I can keep pushing in and pushing out before I'm just going to have to give it all up. I know that this outpost at the at the top is most likely going to be uh, to be sieged down. So now we're in full damage control mode. 
So our 1000 wood has arrived back home. What we're doing with that 1000 wood is we're going to be building some banks and we're going to be building other infrastructure. We've kept most of our villages on food so that we've got the appropriate food to build up our banks. So we've dropped two banks down. And in addition to the bank, we'll also throw down a market. The market is going to enable us, if we miss macro, to correct our macro. Once you're in the Fortress Age, I really enjoy playing a mobile army. I, I love starting out with a stable, just because of how effective Dragoon units are. They're able to run around the map, they can harass settlers, and they're able to do so without consequence. It's very rare that Dragoon units get caught. And because of their, their strength, they just really make for the, the perfect Fortress Age unit, and they're a really great unit to mass. So it's not uncommon in matchups like the French versus Dutch to see both civilizations just massing their respective Dragoon units. To the north of the map, we've changed our shipment point back to the outpost. We're going to be shipping in some rooters just to do some light harassment, prevent that enemy from gathering that food that he wants so badly. So if we take a look at the minimap, we can see that the enemy is quite restricted to where he's got options to hunt. He's got two deer just near that gold mine and a, and a big herd, which we're protecting or we're guarding. And he's got a couple of deer just to the south of his base. But with those two, with the exception of those two things, there's really nothing here. So what we're doing or what we're seeking to do by shipping eight skirmishes is to completely deny him the ability to hunt. We know that if he kills this outpost, he's going to gain access to six of the, the moose up here. And we don't want him to be able to do that because we want to uh, prevent him from gathering as much as possible. So our hussars are a little bit late in the queue. If we could have these hussars over here right now, it would be a very different fight. But what we're seeking to do is prevent him from destroying that outpost so that our skirmishes can come in. But unfortunately, it's not really a fair fight. Instead of shipping Dragoons, like I expected, he actually shipped Curiseers. And the Curiseers are just going to absolutely uh, destroy the skirmishes. They're going to provide that little bit of extra oomph for the mass. And it means that my rooters just aren't able to deal with it effectively. And so we really just have to back away from here and hope that the enemy leaves us alone so that we can continue working on our economy. Fortunately, as the Dutch, I'm not interested in putting up more than one trading, uh, more than one town center. So it means that all I really need to do is keep producing units out of my stable and continue adding banks. As long as I do that, then I'm going to be in an okay position. So I'm now putting up my fourth bank towards the front of my base and I'm continuing applying pressure on the map. All I'm doing with these hussars is making it so the enemy is disincentivized from coming to attack me. The sooner the enemy attacks me, the sooner they're going to be garrisoning my villages, they're going to be sniping my rooters, and I need time to mass. I'm in damage control mode at the moment, and I don't want him to leave his base. So we spot that the, the enemy does indeed have Dragoon units now. That means that we have to be exceptionally careful with our Hussars, because if we make one wrong move, we're going to lose absolutely all of them. At this point, we enter the Dragoon Wars. The Dragoon Wars are a, state, are a stage in the middle uh, to, to late Fortress Age, where each side will simply just mass Dragoons. So normally what you'll see is both sides will avoid building any skirmishes and they'll just be uh, facing each other with Dragoons, uh, just because of the mobility that Dragoons provide. Uh, they're a lot... Uh, swifter, they're a lot quicker than infantry, and they're not as um, they're not as vulnerable to enemy artillery. So we know that he's got the two Falk shipment in his deck. If we ship skirmishes, they're just going to get eaten up. So what we do is we absolutely uh, need to avoid uh, doing that because it's just going to be a waste of a shipment. And the enemy's built up quite a significant mass of skirmishes. And the consequence of doing this means that he has now become vulnerable to that, that same artillery uh, fire. So what we're going to be doing as a, a response to that is we're going to be putting down our own artillery foundry. 
So when it comes to doing an artillery foundry timing, do not be afraid to sell your resources so that you can get out extra artillery. Because when it comes to artillery, the difference between one falconet and two falconet is huge. Between two and three, it's big. Three and four, not so much. So if you can get out that third or that second falconet, it's going to make an absolutely huge difference to the impact that you can provide uh, to your army. So we've lost our Hussars over in the enemy base, but we've been able to slightly distract him. We haven't been able to slow him down. So our plan at the moment is to just simply wait it out. Once our Falconets arrive, we're just going to be keeping them nice and safe behind our buildings, preventing them from dying and guarding them with our Rooters. Hopefully that's going to buy us time so that we can rebuild our banks because we've gone down to three banks now and we'll be able to establish our, our, our economy up again. So we've now put our third Falconet in the queue. We're really just waiting for them to pop at this point. What we want to do is we want to bring the skirmishers. So here I'm baiting the skirmishers. I'm moving them. So what happened was the skirmishers all tried to come over and they've all moved together closer as a consequence. So now they're all more tightly packed together. The Falconets are all uh, are sitting very safely between all this infrastructure, and it means if the enemy wants to come in and try and snipe them, he's going to have to really make an effort to do so, and he's going to lose a lot of units. So we've lost the first Falconet, but at what cost for the enemy? The enemy's skirmisher mass has been completely destroyed. He's got six skirmishers left. The Dragoons are, are, are pumping in, and we've been able to hold very successfully. We've lost only a single Falconet and a handful of Rooters, and we've managed our hold really really well so it just goes to show uh, when it comes to these fortress age fights even though skirmishes might be the appropriate response uh, when it comes to the rock paper scissors system the falconets really are the dynamite when it comes to fortress age fights we have to be uh, uh, careful to avoid building too many falconets and not and not having a, enough cavalry to guard them as we can see with the enemy, he hasn't had enough cavalry to guard his own falconets, which is shipped in. So we've just simply gone and uh, headed into melee mode. And we have done some, uh, some falconet killing. So I'm, I'm dropping down my second stable again. My, my first one was sieged. And the idea is that we just want to spam rooters. We're shipping cav combat. It's going to make our, our rooters extra potent. And we want to hide our falconets. We do not want him to find these falconets. We have no protection for these at all. So it's really, really important. We just keep these at the back of our base. If he pushes in, even with his entire army and there's a whole bunch of skirmishes, we don't want to know about it. We, we just we want to make sure that we keep these falconets safe. So the skirmishers heading towards the north. To deal with uh, this, we're just going to put our rooters into melee mode. And all we want to do with this is, is just, we don't really want to kill the skirmishers. We just want to delay them and prevent them from killing our units while we get our falconets into position to deal with them. So I, because I see how well the rooters are dealing with it, I decide that falconets probably are just better off remaining hidden. The enemy can very easily run in with his, you know, 14 or 15 dragoons and kill all three of these falconets. So I just need to make sure they're protected at all costs. We don't want to fight the enemy. So he starts to build up quite a significant mass here. I realize that I'm I'm in a difficult spot, so I call Minutemen. Minutemen are always going to uh, disincentivize a person to stay around. Uh, just because the nature of their statistics, they're, they're very, very strong. Um, and obviously, over time, they, they get less and less strong. So if you can just call Minutemen, it can... Even if they've got an overwhelming mass, it can often uh, ward off an enemy uh, just because they see it and they and they immediately react. And that's what I successfully did. I was quite worried there that the enemy would be pushing in. So here you can see I'm actually struggling with hotkeys just because I don't play Dutch as much as I play Sweden. And what happens is I'm trying to find the hotkey for a stable or for my artillery foundry. And for Sweden, it's on different keys because they don't have the bank. Uh, but the... The Dutch obviously have the bank, so it throws everything out. So it can be a little bit difficult to deal with. So we, we've managed to snipe the Falconet with our town center. And it means that now the enemy really doesn't have any siege. So he doesn't really have an incentive to be here other than picking off units. So if we can avoid fighting him, then we're going to be in a prime position. The main issue that we're going to have now is that the enemy's got ranged Dragoon units. And he's going to be 
if he's if he's competent, he's going to be applying pressure to my coin mines. He's going to be applying pressure to my hunts, and I'm at the moment uh, down south. I am getting away with hunting or uh, with this coin mine, and I really shouldn't be, because the enemy has outmassed me quite significantly. But nevertheless, we're able to continue uh, without being punished. So we're using our Explorer to provide line of sight. We've also got him in melee mode. And the idea here is that he's going to be snaring any units that he comes across. So just by him snaring, he's going to reduce the movement speed of, of one unit. And by reducing the movement speed of the one unit, it enables us to uh, respond more swiftly. So there we see he's he's snared a, a Dragoon and we're able to get off more shots. So we spot the enemy throwing down an arsenal in the middle of the map. It's a very unusual spot, but what that does is that tells us something. That tells us the enemy is really gearing up for this Dragoon fight. He's going to be researching ranged cavalry caracol from his arsenal, so we need to make sure that we match him. When it comes to Dra Dragoon Wars, we need to make sure that we've got every advantage possible. And for us, that means having an extra plus two range and extra attack from the ranged cavalry caracol. So at this point, we're just looking for anything that's going to upgrade our cavalry. We've got no further cards in our deck like the French, who have got three. We've only got the one card in the Fortress Age. So it means that we've now just got to start resorting to sending uh, shipments of resources. So we've got wood. So with this wood, we're going to be able to build further infrastructure. And with the Dragoon fights, once it reaches a, a certain point, it becomes more effective to actually start rebuilding skirmishes. Because the skirmishers are able to effectively snipe off the Dragoons. And your mass of Dragoon units becomes so large that artillery threats are not as significant to you anymore. Which is why I'm now putting down this barracks. We've reached a point where we've got enough rooters that if there was falconets from the enemy, they wouldn't last a single volley. And so the, the rooters have reached that critical mass and that's why we're now able to begin adding in our skirmishers. So we're continuing uh, applying, or we're continuing building more and more rooters throughout the mid game. The issue that we're going to have is that we're running out of natural resources. So the enemy's got map control on us. They've got a higher score than us. They've got a, a larger mass than us. We've got these, we've got falconets. We've still got these falconets from before. We haven't lost them. So we've been very fortunate in keeping them. So what we have is an immobile army. And it means that we could really be getting punished right now by the enemy, but we're fortunate. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing because it's working at the moment. And if we see the enemy, we will react to them. Uh, but hopefully we're, they're just going to continue letting us gather. We're, we're starting to move out more and more of our settlers uh, down the map, which means that we need to start gaining some form of map control. Our router numbers are climbing up. We're reaching about 50 routers at this point. We've got 44 now. So it means that we can start feeling safe about adding more barrackses. Because when we've got more barrackses, we're able to produce more skirmishes. And we're, as Dutch, what we want to be doing for our mid to late game composition is looking at about 50 routers, 50 skirmishes, and a mix of heavy cannons, falconets, and culverin. So here I've spotted the enemy has aged up to the fourth age. The first thing, or the only thing I'm doing right now is I'm trying to take out as many enemy units as I can before he ages up. Because I'm able to fight him with a fair fight at this point. It's veteran units against veteran units. I know that I've got at most another 15 to 20 seconds where I can keep trading with him efficiently. And by doing that, it means that I reduce the impact of his push if he, if he so chooses to push uh, with his guard units. So... We want to avoid fighting him when it's guard units of, against veteran units. We're going to be seeking to age up ourselves, but we really need to wait until we've got our guard upgrades. So that means, so here I'm clicking. You can see he's already got his guard dragoons, so we don't want to we don't want to touch him at all. Uh, and we can see he is in the same position as us. He's got villagers all over the map, so we're just going to uh, continue killing and kiting. We we use our explorer in a really cheeky way. So with the Explorer, there's a num number of different ways that you can sort of exploit his uh, abilities in, in the late game. And one of the things I, I love to do is use him as a distraction. So here I'm throwing up uh, w which politician. There's so many good politicians to go. There's, there's really all four politicians, four out of five politicians here I, I could really utilize. 
So with the Explorer, what I'm going to be doing is just sieging a house. And the whole time I'm sieging that house, it's just going to be ringing in the enemy's ear. He's under attack. He's under attack. And while it might not seem like a lot, this puts a person on tilt really quickly. And if he doesn't go and deal with that, it's just going to continue happening. So it's quite common in games where I will actually burn down an enemy's house just simply because they won't deal with it. Now, even though I'm going up to the fourth age, I'm opting to ship to ship uh, skirmishes here. And the reason why is because I can feel a push is coming. I know that the enemy is going to want to be hitting me with his guard dragoons before I age up. So what I need to do is I need to ensure my mass of skirmishes is large enough so that when the enemy pushes, I'm able to deter him. And unfortunately, he, he's found some villages down here. It means that we're going to lose quite a huge amount. We're All we're, all we're doing is trying to uh, take out one or two units here and of, and encourage him not to chase anymore. We, we just want to discourage him from that. So we're starting to add to our skirmisher mass now. It's starting to look uh, pretty good. He hasn't seen our skirmishers at this stage, so he doesn't know that we're building it up. We're also bringing our falconets, so we're happy to take this fight because we've got the skirmishers to back us up. He needs to make a, a choice whether he takes this fight or, or whether he leaves, and he, he decides that it's best to leave, and rightly so, because we were in a position where uh, we we definitely had the upper hand there just because of the skirmishers enable us to, to take out an extra unit per volley. So uh, we've been very fortunate in that our age up politician has rallied to the enemy raid. Uh, the skirmishers don't do as much damage because we haven't shipped the upgrade cards for them yet because we haven't actually been building them. And the enemy comes in and tries to take a snipe at our falconets. And so we body block them. And by body blocking them, it discourages the enemy from trying to, to push in and, and clean up those last two falconets. And successfully we do that. We're still fighting here at the north. We really don't mind losing a couple villages if it means that we get to take out these five dragoons for free, which we've been able to do so. We've now got our guard skirmisher upgrade. That's the real key upgrade because our entire enemy army composition is dragoons. So by going, we, we're not interested in getting the carabiner upgrade because the rooters only kept us in the mid game. They're not going to keep us winning the late game. And by upgrading our skirmishers to guard, it's going to mean that we can deal with the, uh, the dragoon units a lot more effectively and try and pull ourselves back into this game. So we're rallying all of our units to the front here, preventing the enemy from obtaining line of sight. We're dropping down extra barracks because we've been pushed off our hunts. We've built up quite a huge amount of excess wood here and we spot the first heavy cannon. So with the heavy cannon, there's a couple of different ways that you can deal with it. I've elected to try and combat it through brute force here instead of waiting for a culverin or trying to hit it with falconets. So I'm splitting up my units using the stagger stance. With the stagger stance, you need to be really careful. When you've got more than 30 units and you use the stagger stance, what's going to happen is your units are actually going to move closer together. They're not going to, to stagger uh, further apart. So you can see that my units are all quite closely and, and tightly all held together at the moment. So we've lost all of our rooters. We're probably going to be losing our falconets here, but ideally we want to avoid losing our massive skirmishers. If the enemy wants to build gendarmes, he's going to need to upgrade them to be, at, to be uh, you know reasonable uh, units. So we're not too worried about seeing you know a surprise mass of gendarmes popping out of somewhere. We continue to uh, experience this excess in wood. So I'm thinking about ways that I can transition off the wood and obtain some form of advantage. We ship our first fa factory and we're continuing building our skirmishes. Uh, we've decided to sell the wood and we're starting training of a culverin. We can see there's the enemy's second heavy cannon. We know that because he only had that one heavy cannon, it means he's put down his factory. Now that a second one has come out so quickly, he's got his second factory out as well. He's got both of his factories on heavy cannons, which means we can't be fighting with brute force anymore against heavy cannons. Once heavy cannons reach a critical mass of about two or three, you cannot be brute forcing them. You will simply lose too many units. They've got way too much health, and as a consequence, you're gonna you're just gonna lose your entire army. So we need to train culverins. It's the only way that we can deal with it. Our first factory arrives. 
we're going to pop it down ideally we're just going to be keeping him on coin in the interim uh, by having him on coin he's just going to be helping out with our very coin heavy units we've got the skirmisher and the ruder which are both coin heavy and on top of that we're now trying to train culverin as well so we really need as much coin as we we can while there is a mine to the north it doesn't have a lot left on it so i'm, I'm sure there's there's people watching saying you know, go get that mine to the north and yes that that's definitely part of my plan it's just not uh there, there we go uh, I, I i listen to you guys <laughs> So we're getting Gunner's Quadrant. Gunner's Quadrant is a really, really important upgrade. It's going to give us six extra line of sight for our Culverin. It's going to enable us to, to spot the enemy artillery from further away. Now the second uh, Heavy Cannon is rolling in. And it, it's a very difficult position to micro because we want to avoid losing skirmishes to the Dragoons. But we need to prevent the Dragoons from hitting our Culverin and have our Culverin in range to hit our, the Heavy Cannon. So there's the first Heavy Cannon going down. The second heavy cannon, he's having trouble microing it uh, because we're keeping our skirmishes back. And before the first volley goes off, I'm not sure if you, you witnessed it, but we actually uh, moved our units into stagger mode as the cannonball was coming in and reduced the effect of that cannonball. So it's it's a, a more advanced micro technique. It's something that you have to be very reactive to when it's happening. Uh, and normally the best way to do it is just simply by selecting a small amount of skirmishes, just hitting W on your keyboard if you're like me and you're using the the brand new uh, default hotkeys. It's, it's very simple. You just hit W on your keyboard and it's going to change your stance immediately. And then you just right click, move them, and they will just spread apart instantly. And now we've got the, heavy, the third heavy cannon rolling in and our culverin are just tasked hitting it. And at this point, our mass has begun to build up to the point where our opponent can't deal with it. Ideally, he should have been mixing in skirmishes as well. But having Voltigers, they're a little bit more expensive than just the guard skirmishes. And so it's a lot more of an investment. And as a result, he's disincentivized to go for skirmishes. The next heavy cannon begins rolling in. And it's we're doing that same thing. So that we can see my explorer has actually burnt down uh, one of those houses. And... And we've picked off the this heavy cannon uh, just with our rooters and our culverin. And our mass at this point is too great. The enemy really isn't in a position where he can fight us. Uh, our, our skirmishers were, were doing a little bit of a, a dance back there. So hopefully they've decided to fight the enemy again. And from here, we can just continue uh, doing this. So we would only mix falconets or heavy cannons if the enemy started mixing in skirmishes. But because he's not mixing in skirmishes, we don't need to worry about that. We can just stick with culverin, we can stick with skirmishes, and we can stick with rooters. We don't need to upgrade our rooters uh, to guard, and there we have the enemy defeating. So, uh, or con the enemy conceding. So, the game overall was a, a cheese game where we had to adapt our strategy from having a, a looking for that easy win and turning it into a game where we actually have to play a heads up game, you know, and really uh, fight from behind. We were in a difficult position. We were getting pushed in by a huge mass of skirmishers, a huge mass of, of dragoons. We were completely outnumbered and we had to leverage the power of our town center to hold off the enemy. This was a really enjoyable game for me to play because it was a game where I not only got to do a little bit of meme magic, but I was actually able to play a really competitive game against a player. I was able to play from behind and I was able to become victorious through small micro mechanics, through having a, a fundamental understanding of the game mechanics and by avoiding losing my falconets. That really was the key. Just keeping those falconets uh, alive means that it's a big target for the enemy and he's going to try and suicide units to kill those falconets even though he has absolutely no infantry people just they're, they're they're just attracted to them they're like they're like a magnet so if you've enjoyed this game i encourage you to leave a like down below if you haven't done so already i encourage you to join the discord we've got a lot of good resources on there including my deck picks so if you'd like to see my decks for the dutch and other civilizations head over to the discord and check those out on on there other than that i hope that you've enjoyed this game and been able to take something away from it thank you for watching